Today's Gospel reading is from Mark 1, verses 1 through 8. Mark begins the Gospel with the announcement of the coming of John the Baptist. The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the child of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I send my messenger before your face, who shall prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the sovereign, make the paths of the sovereign straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And there went out to John all the country of Judea and all of the people of Jerusalem, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, and he had a leather girdle around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes the one who is mightier than I, the thong of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but the one who comes will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. May God add understanding to this reading of the Gospel. Join me in singing the Gloria. It's number 812. Glory be to the Maker. just left me with my spirit soaring high in the sky, like an eagle flapping its wings and flying around. Would you join me in prayer? God, I come to you once again, offering myself as a tool, as an instrument to do the things you would have me do. I pray that on this day, at this time, that you would bless and anoint my lips and my tongue, so the words I would speak today would be your words and not my own. Help me to remove myself and point toward the light. Be with each of us and open our hearts and our ears so that each and every person who is listening may hear the message you would have that person here on this day on their journey. It's in the name of Jesus Christ I pray. Amen. You know, over the past few months, many people have found themselves in the dark as hurricanes and earthquakes have disabled power grids providing the needed electricity for light at night. And in those dark places, we have witnessed an amazing thing. Humanity's goodness came to light. There have been many stories on the news about citizens and neighbors digging strangers out from under the rubble of earthquakes, opening their homes and businesses to those displaced by hurricanes, as well as gathering clothing and food and medical supplies for people that need them. The people who were in their greatest hour of need found God in the dark through those acts of compassion. The Christmas season also reminds us of some of the darkness in our lives. Dysfunctional families. I once heard a social worker say, to say the term dysfunctional <coughs> family is to be redundant. All families are dysfunctional. Loss of loved ones, distance between ourselves and people we yearn to be with. The political climate reminds us of the inequality and the hardships that a few people force upon the weak and the downtrodden. We often think of night in negative terms. 
I say to our dog Dasher sometimes at night when he goes out in the backyard, watch out for the monsters. Or go get the monsters. And when I say that, he just runs barking. You know? And then he comes in like, I ran all the monsters away. And we're proud of him. We tell him that. We think of night as being negative at a time when we cannot see clearly. But darkness, nighttime, can also be a spiritual condition and a spiritual opportunity. The same way that things are difficult to see at night, the deepest relationship between God and our soul, between God and our spirit, is often hidden from our conscious awareness. Paul speaks of the spirit as it prays in us with groans and utterances too deep for words. Or in otherwise, sometimes we don't even understand what's happening. In scripture, darkness seems to be the time when God is most at work. God often comes to people in their dreams at night. And it is time when Jesus goes to pray. From the Psalms, Psalm 42, it says, By the day the Lord commands steadfast love. And at night, God's song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. The season of Advent invites us to find God in the dark. And when I say in the dark, I don't necessarily mean at nighttime, but in the dark emptiness of your spirit, of your life. For us who live in the Northern Hemisphere, darkness comes sooner around Christmas at the end of the day. Remember when you used to sit out not very many months ago? You could sit outside at 7, 7.30 and the sun was still shining. And now you go out there at 5.30 or 6 and it's almost gone. All of us will count the days as well as the nights in anticipation of the birth of Jesus during this Advent season. Luke doesn't tell us if Gabriel the angel spoke to Mary during the night. We always think of that as being a nighttime, but it doesn't really say but the angel's words open a place of fruitful darkness in her, in her womb where God will be born. In this season of waiting and expectation, let us be like Mary. And when we have a request from God or a message from God, let us say, yes, Mary was a young girl. I'm not sure she probably understood everything the angel was telling her, but she believed it to be from God. And she didn't hesitate in saying, yes. Let us trust God's dark and mysterious work within us. And let God's acts of compassion be birthed from us into a hurting world. We hear the word of John the Baptist in today's reading. Now, you know, John the Baptist plays a big part in Advent. I read something this week where it says, you know, we often overlook John. But in some liturgical years, the readings in Advent have John mentioned more than once. It's like two, John gets two whole Sundays out of four. We hear the word from John in today's reading. And by the way, John is very important. But I challenge you to go to Walmart and find a Christmas card that has John the Baptist on it. Yet, he's one of the main characters. He tells us what's going to happen. Three of the gospel writers link John to Isaiah's prophecy about a voice crying in the wilderness, calling people to prepare a way to a journey back home from exile. And in the fourth gospel, he is a witness to Jesus, the light, the light of the world. But the one thing about John, and the one thing we can learn from John, is that he always points toward Jesus. He always directs people toward Jesus the light. So we might say, well, if John is so important, how can he inspire us today? What can I learn from John the Baptist that will help me go out and be a better person? Well, I've got three things for you. Get ready to etch these down in your mind. John was a holy troublemaker. He was a prophet speaking truth 
to power. Someone who gains a following among the people, and he was a thorn in the side of the ones in power, both civic and religious leaders. He was a pain. John was an artist. Not only an artist, he was a performance artist. He acted out his message in very dramatic ways. Look how he dressed. He probably didn't have to wear camel hair. Itchy, sticky. He probably could have eaten more than just locusts and honey from the desert. He could have trimmed his beard and at least have washed it. Can you imagine? He gained attention by being a performance artist. He baptized people in the River Jordan, dipping them under the water, pointing toward a radical change that was about to happen. He even said the ax, the ax is poised at the roots of the tree. It's going to be chopped down and things are going to be new. Can you imagine if you were the one in control of everything, listening to him? You'd probably go, we need to get rid of this guy. The third thing, John was a preacher, a witness pointing to Jesus as the one whose life and work will bring new and greater possibilities for transforming lives. The one who takes away the sins of the world. What a wonderful message he had to bring. I'm not sure that people understood what his message was, but it sounded good. It sounded uplifting and positive. It sounded like something new was coming that was better than what they had. Just like John, just like John, you, you, each one of you, are called by God today to speak out and act out your faith as we prepare for the coming of Jesus. Now, Advent is not the coming, really, of the birth of Jesus, because, duh, we know Jesus has already been born. But it's to prepare for the coming of Jesus, and it's to prepare for opening yourself up to let Jesus into your very spirit and into your heart and into your life. Like John, we are called to listen in the darkness of the desert, to God's Spirit calling to us and speaking to us. And we are called to point toward the light of the new day that's dawning. Like John, we are called to bring others to Christ, not by our own power. And I was thinking today on the way here. The one weakness of this church and it's also our greatest strength, is that we want to bring people to Christ, not through guilt, but through a positive relationship. That's radical. How many of you grew up in a church where you were told what a horrible sinner you were and how you needed to repent? I probably have said this before, but one day, one Sunday, we came home from church. I was with my mom. I was probably about 11 or 12. And I looked at mom and said, why do they keep telling me why I'm going to burn in hell? Wouldn't it be better for them to tell me how not to? That's what we're about at Spirit of Peace. It's how to make our lives better and how to make the lives of the people around us better by the power of God's love, God's compassion, God's forgiveness, and God's grace for each and every person. Like John, each and every one of us are called to point toward Christ, not to ourselves. And sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes we do something we think is great and we think we ought to get credit. Remember the scripture says, if you do something really good and you get credit now for doing it, don't expect any credit later. You've already got yours. That was paraphrasing, by the way. We are called to point toward Christ, not to ourselves. Sometimes that's hard to do. 
but we have to strive to do it each and every day in our lives on our journeys. And then I'm going to end it with a bumper sticker for you today. After all, it's not your birthday that we're celebrating. Amen.